Hello, everybody, and welcome to the fourth day of American Cities Rebuilding. I'm Frank Sesno, and you're tuned in for some fascinating and very important conversations about climate change. Uh, for the past year, I've been working with WNET as part of the Planet Forward project I started with their Peril and Promise portal on uh, Climate Portal and doing a variety of programming in this space. So this conversation is absolutely in everybody's sweet spot, I think. We will begin here today with a discussion about seawalls for our country's coastal cities with experts in Houston and Florida and how climate change and these pressures are intensifying the need and the interest in seawalls and other barriers, protections, and actions that need to be taken. And then my colleague Kira Buckley from Houston Public Media will talk to an all-female panel of energy experts. We'll hear some special stories about special people working in wind energy. We'll hear from a dynamic young leader who's championing the climate cause among conservatives. And I'll talk about what it'll take to make the 21st century energy dreams actually happen, infrastructure, with the CEO of New Jersey's largest electric gas and utility. I'd like to thank the sponsors of American Cities Rebuilding for their crucial support. Sue and Edgar Wackenheim III, the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation, United Airlines, PSEG, and PwC. I'd now like to get right to it uh, by welcoming Dr. Philip Bedient. You know, he's a professor at Rice University, the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. He's been looking at coastal cities and water for a very long time and knows exactly what uh, is at stake here. And Dr. Tiffany Troxler, she's the director at the Sea Level Solutions Center at Florida International University. And good day to both of you. Phil, hi, how are you? Great, thank you. And Tiffany, welcome to you as well. Hello, thank you. Let me start, Phil, with you um, talking about just how critical, I mean, we're getting toward the COP26 climate talks in Glasgow. This is a conversation, climate change across the board. We're talking about cities, water, coastal areas and cities. How critical is that issue in this mix? It is extremely critical. I've, uh, I've been looking at the problem very carefully since the early 2000s. And I, I worked Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans and of course, Hurricane Ike that, that so devastated Houston in 2008. It, it is, of course, that's the Gulf Coast but this is also impacting um, many, many areas along Florida and, and up the Eastern seaboard as well. It's, it's a huge issue. Tiffany, you're in Florida, you live there, you study it uh, among other things. Florida is already experiencing some cities, sunny day flooding. Is, mm -hmm. is the future here? Uh, what are cities confronting now? Um, so, I mean, what we're seeing are um, climate change uh, impacts associated with or that are resulting in increased sea level rise. Um, and that has the uh, impact of increasing the frequency of tidal flooding or the sunny day flooding that we observe. Uh, we can have more intense rainstorms, which exacerbates, uh, which can exacerbate flooding. And then also um, increase uh, frequency of intense more intense storms, and those all contribute to uh, flood impacts that we observe locally, um, and uh, and many impacts to our city's infrastructure and quality of life. To both of you, and, and Tiffany, go first with this. In looking at at heat, um, what science is finding is that this is actually accelerating. What's it's moving more quickly than than earlier projections had indicated. Is that also happening with sea level rise and coastal erosion? Is it accelerating as a problem? Tiffany, go first. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so and and you know we are seeing an increased number of days over ninety degrees, um, and but that's that's all. That trend is also exacerbated by uh, urbanization. So we have more impervious surface. Uh, we have uh, less ability for a uh, natural system to sort of absorb and, and shade our um, uh, people that are on the ground from heat exposure. Um, but the, the increase of, of uh, urbanization can also exacerbate that influence. of and Is that acceleration in heat mirrored in acceleration of sea level rise and coastal erosion as well? Are you seeing that problem accelerate? Um, yeah, I mean, these are these are all fundamentally 
a result of changing climate. And yes, as we're um, as the oceans are warming up, our atmosphere is also warming up, and those things are uh, happening uh, coincidentally. Bill, what are the implications for our cities? Well, especially in the Gulf Coast area, where, where I'm an expert, uh, we're seeing that that, that warming Gulf, uh, we're, we're, we're having uh, during, during the hurricane season, we're seeing temperatures in the water higher than they've ever been. And of course, they just keep getting higher and higher. Those tend to exacerbate and, and quickly allow a hurricane to strengthen. And for example, some of the recent hurricanes that have come in, some of the cat fours and fives that are impacting coastlines all relate to the fact that you've got these warmer waters that are, you know, of course, driving, they're the main energy driver for the hurricane. And we're seeing that very quickly strengthening of these storms coming across the Gulf is create the most dangerous hurricanes that we face. Now, holding hands with this, is a vast increase in the dollar damage in coastal areas that some of these storms are causing. Um, so how closely are, Phil, are, and start with this one, how, how closely are you monitoring that? And because that not only represents actual damage that needs to be repaired for these cities, but it's also a tax base. There's a, there are tax implications there. Well, in Houston, unfortunately, we face both threats uh, and we, we refer to this as compound flooding. Uh, in Houston, we're fairly low level. And so we can get very extreme rainfalls associated with these hurricanes. And so it's kind of a compound threat. And for example, during, during Harvey uh, in 2017, the, the largest rainfall that ever befall the United States in history, uh, that was all caused by a stalled system uh, that was again related to climate change and related to sort of a blocking mechanism so that the hurricane could not get out of it. And those are the most dangerous storms that we face. They become tropical storms, and then they dump 20 to 40 inches of rain on an urban area. And it, it, is, it is absolutely devastating. Tiffany? Um, absolutely. We, it, and what we experience here in South Florida is a, a very shallow groundwater table. So our groundwater levels are very close to the surface of the land. And you know these intense rainfall events um, uh, and, and rain that accompany um, uh, hurricanes. Um, it also contributes to this uh, phenomenon that that Phil referred to, which is uh, compound flooding. Which cities are most vulnerable and have been feeling the most the most effects and the most damage from all of this, Phil? Oh, I would I would say uh, you know Texas were bigger. <laughs> And we get more rain than anybody. The advantages that Florida has is they do have sandy soils, and, and so they get some infiltration capacity there. They get hit probably by more hurricanes than, than we do uh, in, in, in Texas. But you put that combination together, and especially what's happened in the last 10 years in Texas. Uh, oh my gosh, uh, I would say Houston and New Orleans are probably near the top of the list, but I would say Miami is close, close third. I'm not sure it's a list that anybody wants to be on. And then from there, you just go right up the, right up the coastline. New York gets, uh, you know, they, they get credit too for Sandy and all that. But uh, uh, on, in the grand scheme of things, Sandy was a devastating storm, but, but nothing like what hits the Gulf Coast in Florida. Tiffany, what cities are you most concerned about in terms of both their vulnerability to these trends and their preparation and their, their very infrastructure, uh, which can be you know, a, a, a much, much bigger complication here. Yeah, absolutely. And when we, we do have more infrastructure, uh, we have more inertia in our cities that makes it more difficult to incorporate strategies that can help us to adapt to climate change. So, you know, even younger cities may have a little more flexibility in terms of uh, adapting at a city and larger scale um, when we can work with things like natural infrastructure to uh, reduce and, and lessen the impacts of climate change, particularly related to flooding and heat. 
So let's talk about what can be done to lessen the impacts. I mean, let's, and just as, a, as an example, Norfolk has a huge naval base and there's a real concern about what's happening with sea level rise there. New York City has its subways and we've seen flooding in the subways. Um, Miami has had, you know, very serious rainy, uh, sunny day flooding on streets uh, in the middle of perfectly uh, decent weather. Boston has a huge uh, liquid, liquefied national gas facility in a place where if they didn't have to pay a fortune, they probably should move it. So what, what can cities do looking forward to prepare for this future with so much on the line? Tiffany, you want to go first with that? Sure, yeah. So um, in, uh, in the greater Miami and the beaches, we have something called the Resilient 305 Strategy. So this was a, a comprehensive approach at trying to address uh, community resilience. And uh, our local universities have, um, have the privilege of working closely with our, our, our city leaders and uh, community-based organizations in order to understand how with each resilience investment that's made, we're monitoring and trying to learn from those, um, those investments and the projects that result from them so we can improve the resilience building process over time. So having that strong coordination and collaboration across sectors, across organizations is really fundamental and is something that is really amazing to see that's happening across the US. Phil, what are you looking for to happen across the U.S. and cities if, if they're really getting serious about preparing well, in, for the future? In the Gulf Coast, both in, in New Orleans, where, of course, the Dutch came in and helped them build a, a major defense system there, which, which actually worked pretty well uh, during the hurricane surge events, not so much on the flooding, but it certainly addressed the surge. We're doing the same thing in Houston and, in fact, the universities in Texas Rice and UT and Texas A&M are all contributing significantly to helping with the design of a coastal spine along with perhaps something in Bay and Galveston Bay so that we end up with multiple lines of defense, which again, we learned that concept from the Dutch and, and they've known about it for hundreds of years and, and they've done a great job over there and we use them as a model and we interact with them very closely as well. So that, that is one thing we're doing on the coastal side. And then, of course, on the inland side with flooding, uh, there it's just really an infrastructure problem. Houston has grown way too fast without the proper controls in place over, over the years. And that's why we're in the trouble we're in now. Phil, do, do, will seawalls every place work? There's the, we have a, a viewer who says, it real, is it realistic to think we could build a, a, a dike south of Houston? <laughs> well... Yeah, that's a that's a really good point, and and of course it's a, it's a big price tag to put a seventy mile uh, dike in uh, down along Galveston and, and along the coast. There is, is a you know it's a twenty five to thirty billion dollar expense, but that's again the amount of money that was invested in uh, in in New Orleans. If you don't do it, the other question is if you do nothing, then you run the risk of having a fifty to a hundred billion dollar impact on the national economy by a direct hit, mainly because we are the petrochemical center of the United States. And all of those tanks and all of those facilities are prone to significant environmental impact. Tiffany, what are, what are cities going to have to do and what can they do to, to if you'll excuse the pun, turn the tide here? Um, I mean, <laughs> seawalls and things like that, is that the answer? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's not a one size fits all um, approach that's that's going to work here. And and in fact, um, seawalls don't work as well in places like South Florida, where we have a very transmissive aquifer. Um, so it's going to be a suite of solutions, and it really needs to involve the community because these are the people that are going to be living in our cities now and into the future. Um, so we need to work closely with our community members to. Uh, understand how we can design and implement strategies that can work for all of us. Let me ask you both very quickly in the, in the very little time we have remaining as countries and governments gather in Glasgow for COP26 and the focus of the world is on these climate talks. What are you both looking for with, in, in, in your area, in your specialization in terms of rising sea levels, coastal erosion, and the, and the things that cities around the world are going to need to be doing going forward. Phil, you want to go first on this one? 
thanks for the simple question. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I would say that the most important thing we need to do in, in Houston and Texas area is recognize that climate change is now with us. It is actually happening. I've got the data to prove that we're getting more rainfall, more, fre more frequent storms, uh, more intense hurricanes. The data is clear. There's no question about it. The heating over the last 20 to 25 years is clear. And it's so we need the politicians and we need those that are in, in, in government to, uh, to push these agendas forward quickly. Tiffany, Glasgow. Yeah, I, I, you know, try to think about multiple benefit solutions. Investing in natural infrastructure is one of those um, opportunities where we can um, you know, increase the services that we get from natural systems that can benefit uh, people locally. Um, and, and, and also try to think about solutions that allow us to mitigate uh, and reduce CO2 emissions while we're adapting to uh, climate change to ascertain some of those, um, you know, ensuring that we're both mitigating and adapting, not overlooking the bigger issue, which is uh, climate mitigation, reducing CO2 emissions. Tiffany Troxler, Phil Abedian, both of you, thank you so much. And I hope lots of people are listening because this, this is a huge issue and it's gonna present huge challenges going forward, now and going forward. We're not, it, the future is here. So thank thanks you very much. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. We turn things over to my colleague now uh, from Houston Public Media, Kira Buckley. Kira? Hi, thank you so much. My name is Kyra Buckley. I am a reporter with Houston Public Media and I cover the energy industry. Um, I'm, I'm joined today by three guests, but really quickly, I'm just going to uh, set the scene a little bit for us. We're talking today about the energy equation. Does the math add up? Um, as we know, as you've been hearing uh, this year, the UN put out another dire warning about climate change saying it's widespread, it's rapid, it's in intensifying. We know that the way we use and produce energy in some cases is contributing to climate change. Houston is known as the energy capital and it's just one of the places where people are researching innovative ways to power our world without contributing to climate change. So today I'm joined by three experts who are leaders in what we often call the energy transition or the move to cleaner fuels. Uh, so I'm so excited to be joined by Katie Maynard. She's the founder and CEO of Ally Energy. I'm also joined today by Barbara Berger. She's the president of Chevron Technology Ventures. And I am also joined today by Tara Karimi, co-founder and CTO at Semvita Factory. Thanks. Thank you all so much for taking the time and for having this discussion today. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, first, I would just like to start by asking each of you first, if you can expand a little bit more on your role in the world of energy. And can you also tell me from your perspective, how do we meet the global demand for energy and at the same time, lessen the adverse impacts of fossil fuels on our climate? Uh, Katie, let's start with you. Thanks so much and thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I'm Katie Maynard, founder and CEO of Ally Energy. And what Ally focuses on is the people element. Uh, none of this can happen without people. Uh, we have a tremendous opportunity ahead of us uh, to make the necessary investments we need to to decarbonize, but also to find new fuels. And at the center of that, at the heart of all of that are jobs and this new economy in a, in a way to actually do that in an equitable way. So we have a jobs platform where we bring people together to connect them. And at Ally, we believe that you know, really everyone can be a force for good, right? This is something that we all need to embrace. This is something that is very important to society and markets. Um, we heard the speakers earlier talk about um, the COP conference that's coming up in Glasgow. So the world is looking uh, to, the, to, to the energy industry, uh, both incumbents as well as new companies and entrepreneurs to, to drive that transition. And as I will steal from my friend, Barbara Berger, Ground Zero is here in Houston. So it's a very exciting time and thanks for having me. Thanks, Katie, I really appreciate it. Um, and Barbara, next, um, can you just tell me a little bit more about your role in the world of energy and also from your perspective, you know, how do we meet the global demand for energy and at the same time, you know, lessen some of the adverse effects that are uh, contributing to climate change? 
Sure. Hey, thanks, Kyra. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak on the panel and speak with Katie and Tara as well. So um, a little bit about me. Um, I have been working in the energy industry for more than half my life. I'm not sure any of the rest of you can say that. Um, um, and I work for Chevron. And I currently run the Tech Ventures Company. So just a couple of things about, you know, kind of my role in the energy industry. I think uh, Chevron Technology Ventures, longest standing oil and gas corporate venture. We look to partner with the uh, external innovation and figure out a way to integrate it into Chevron. So, you know, it's the ultimate form of inclusive partnership between the incumbent companies and the new companies. Um, in terms of, you know, how do we solve this issue? Um, it's one of the biggest challenges I think that we face. And it's a real challenge that matters because we know that energy enables human progress. Um, we know that energy has to be a number of things. First of all, it has to be accessible. Um, you know, luckily most of us have never had to deal with that. It needs to be affordable. And we uh, have at times understood that it needs to be reliable and it needs to be ever cleaner. Um, and um, the energy system is vast and complex, and it looks different depending on where you are in the world and those four uh, parameters kind of, uh, are, you know, are in slightly different places. You know, at Chevron, you know, we believe the future is lower carbon. Um, we've got a responsibility to meet those energy demands today and in the future. And, you know, simply put, um, we have a traditional business that we continue to work to make it be a reliable and, and affordable and continue to lower the carbon intensity of that traditional business, which is based on oil and gas products. And we're building new businesses, new low carbon value chains, uh, carbon capture, we'll probably talk a little bit about that, hydrogen offsets and more to come. So I think it's a case of, uh, of decarbonizing the system that we have and building in new, uh, car new low carbon value chains. Really big undertaking, um, but an exciting time to be in energy. Thanks, Carter. Thanks. Hey, that's, that's what we're here. We're here to talk about the big ideas. So really, really glad to have you. And Tara Karimi, so glad that you're able to join us today. And would you please um, tell us, you have a very unique perspective. If you can tell folks a little bit more about what you do in the energy world and then, you know, what you really see as, um, you know, how we meet this global demand for energy while also combating climate change. Tara, I'm so sorry. I don't think that your audio is working at the moment. We, which is really a bummer because I'm sure whatever you just said was brilliant. So we are all just going to assume that you wowed us. Um, so sorry. We uh, will hope to get that fixed. And Tara, at any time, feel free to uh, chime in if you get that audio working again. Um, but I actually will just take this opportunity to quickly circle back um, to Katie, when you talked a lot about, um, you know, you work with people, you're part of the people aspect. Can you expand a little bit more about, you know, where that people centered, how, where, where does that fit when we talk about combating this really big problem of, you know, energy usage while lessening the effects of climate change? Well, I think the first thing uh, that's important to talk about is literacy. You know, we all get educated right at a young age. And unfortunately, if you look at the curriculum across the United States, most people don't know where their food comes from. They don't know about their energy. They don't know about their energy consumption. Um, they order something from Amazon. It shows up at the, do the doorstep. And they really don't know what the cost of that is to the environment. And so I think it's important just to kind of start there. And one of the things we're working on right now, we're really excited about is uh, we're launching a children's book. And the children's book in uh, the new year, uh, we hope will make it 
to schools across the nation, um, th third to fifth grade level. But it features women, you know, in energy across the planet. All the different superpowers and superheroes and trailblazers we have out there that are working to decarbonize um, energy. So I think literacy is a big piece. And then the second piece is personal accountability and ownership, right? So what can you control, right? What can you do to get uh, to, to get fit, so to speak? So we step on scales, not all of us, but you know, what are you doing to reduce your footprint? How, um, how are you contributing, right? And showing interest uh, in that. Because as you can, as you can imagine, most people feel the effects of climate. They don't understand though the unintended right consequences of the consumption, you know, that we have on a on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'd say that literacy obviously is important. And then knowing your numbers, very important. Yeah. And as as I continue to do reporting on the energy industry and on climate change, um, absolutely having that kind of shared language um, and realizing again that these are complex issues and there's not, as I believe one of the panelists in the previous session said, you know, it's not a just one answer. That's what experts have been telling me is that there are multiple different paths, um, which I want to talk about some of the exciting innovations. But first, I think we need to talk about some of the barriers. Obviously, we, we've known for decades that climate change is it's happening and it's adversely affecting um, the population. And I'd like to talk about, you know, from your guys's perspective, what some of the barriers to transitioning to cleaner fuels and, and what's being addressed or what's happening to address those barriers. And um, Barbara, this time I'll, I'll start with you. Okay, and hopefully Tara, you're gonna be able to uh, uh, be able to contribute to the conversation. So the barriers, um, so first of all, energy is a commodity. This is not a luxury good. And when we introduce changes, uh, you know, it's a bit of a catch 22 because in order to get the cost to be comparable because we, you know, I mentioned we needed to make it affordable, uh, it needs to be scaled. And so you don't get the cost down until you scale. So you can see that that's a bit of a catch 22. Um, and so that takes, um, that takes policy. It takes a, a framework and understanding of the implications of, of, of what you're asking for. Um, you know, we, we don't favor, um, uh, spelling out specific technologies. We've seen that um, in the past when, you know, it's well-intentioned that you specify, okay, we want more of this technology. And um, then, you know, in a policy incentive or a, or a mandate, and then you can't get it. Um, it maybe solves one problem, maybe creates other problems. And so working together um, from an innovation standpoint, from the sort of the incumbent system from policy, really thinking about the economic. I mean, that's a really complicated kind of multidisciplinary work. So that, I think that's one of the barriers is getting all the right people around the table. Um, they're all educated. Hopefully they'll read Katie's, Katie's books in the future and understand that, but actually work to solve the problem. Um, and, you know, I didn't even mention that politics comes into this, but even putting that aside, you know, making sure that we're all looking at that problem and, and incentivizing um, the right stakeholders going forward. Thank you. Um, I think I'm going to move to Katie with the, oh, actually, I just saw Tara hopefully pop back up and this is a good time. Tara, would you try and uh, Introduce yourself again, and let's see if we have your audio working. Oh, I'm so sorry. It doesn't look like we can hear you. I, I know that all of us uh, empathize as we have all had to navigate this digital workplace over the last year and a half. Um, and I'm really bummed out that we're not able to get you on at this exact moment, but hopefully We've still got about 20 minutes left in our discussion. I hope we can uh, get your insights. Um, Katie, I'm, I'm going to move to you um, to talk a little bit more about the barriers to this. Um, and, you know, feel free to tell me a little bit about what you're hearing from some of the folks that you work with and what you really see is, um, 
you know, what, what have come up uh, that has maybe been a stumbling block and what are some of the things that are being done to address that? Well, I would say, uh, um, so everything's got a challenge. And, you know, as an entrepreneur who started a company seven years ago, uh, back then I didn't feel like I had the best uh, uh, tools available to me. You know, we were early. We had some early ideas around what we wanted to do. But one of the things that I, I want to focus on is really some of the great new things that I know Houston is doing um, to address this burgeoning innovation that's, you know, that's that's coming to bear. So I'm sitting here at Greentown Labs Houston, um, which is a, the number one incubator for climate technology. Uh, and actually, Barbara Berger and, and Chevron, um, Chevron Ventures uh, came together to, to make this happen, along with other companies here in Houston, because there's a real recognition that we need to do something. And, and to do that, we've got to make investments, right? We've got to look at investments in new technologies and, and explore, uh, well, what we did years ago when we discovered oil and gas. There were companies that went out and took risks and developed, you know, new technology. So I'm really excited to be a part of this. It's a, it's a, it's a great uh, kind of ecosystem where we bring people together uh, to, to solve these, these unique challenges. And I think the last barrier I would kind of would, um, speak to you is is the barrier that people think that oil companies are bad. Um, I'm a, a two-time, uh, I've got a background in oil and gas. My, my family is from oil and gas. I've lived all along the Gulf Coast, but I also lost my home to Hurricane Harvey. So it's, it's hit me personally, right? Um, there are many people that are working day to day in the industry and the perception that all oil companies are the same or all of the companies are the same or have different uh, uh, viewpoints, right, on climate is just a false narrative. So we, we need to overcome those barriers. We need to be allies and united in the, the way forward. And we're really excited about the innovation and all the opportunities here in Houston through Green Town Labs. Yeah, and I mean, that backs up a lot of the reporting that I've done here in Houston, um, hearing from different energy companies from all different, you know, different parts of the sector, saying that that technology part it has been a barrier in the past. And we've heard from a lot of folks in the energy world that they are, are working on upping their game in the digital realm. Um, and I know that everybody on this call has been doing work around that. Um, and that brings me to the next thing I wanna talk about, which, you know, what are kind of some of the innovations that are happening right now that you're really excited about that, you know, maybe something that it's happening here in Houston, but it could be something that could be useful to another community that, I mean, there's nowhere like Houston, but we know that other cities are facing these major challenges. Barbara, you mentioned scale, you know, earlier as one of the barriers. Um, so I, I'd love to hear from um, you all it, on some of the things that's exciting you about what's happening um, in the innovation. And Tara, I do wanna go back to you and, uh, give you the opportunity. Uh, can you first of all, just introduce yourself so we can see if we have your mic working? Sure. Uh, can you hear me now? We can. Oh, that's so great. Well, would you would you take a, a minute before we move on to this question? Would you take a minute to um, tell us what you do in the, the energy world and a little bit more about some Vita? Sure. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for your patience. And uh, it was a, pro a technical issue. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, I am Tara Karimi. I'm co-founder and CTO at Sanvita Factory. We are, a, we are a startup company at uh, Houston in the intersection between biotech and energy industry. And uh, our goal is to apply uh, advanced method of uh, biotechnology and bring it into energy industry for sustainability and carbon dioxide utilization. Very cool. Uh, well, thank you so much. So glad to have you. And we'll, I, you know, I'm, um, I'll, I'll go back to my round robin and I'll have, uh, I'll have Katie answer this question first, but um, I think that this is a perfect time, uh, Tara, for you to jump in. So um, Katie, you just mentioned a few things that you're excited about. Um, can you just tell me a little bit more about, you know, what in this realm, you know, is of innovation is exciting you as you look to the future? Well, what I'm excited about is I'm sitting somewhere, I think I mentioned earlier in at Greentown Labs, with all kinds of entrepreneurs, builders, uh, people who've 
who've been a part of the industry. Um, they've been working in energy and they see opportunities to make improvements. And so you typically think of tech, you think Silicon Valley, you think nerds in the garage, young people. Um, I'd like to think I'm still young, but my point being, right, that the, the tech and the innovation that's gonna come out of Houston Okay, as the energy capital of the world in the next two, five, 10 years is exciting. It's going to bring a flourishing. And I think if you look to what we're doing, what we're, what we're having right now with this pandemic is typically on the other side of tough times and disease, you see periods of innovation. And so I, I look around me and I, I think to myself, we're really lucky to be able to focus on this um, and, and meet this challenge. And I think that Houston will continue to be a great place to live. And there's going to be a, an immense amount of capital and an immense amount of jobs and opportunities that are gonna come in the next in the next few years. So that's what gets me up every day. I live on the West side and I drive all the way downtown to be in this lab with these innovators. So um, that's what gets me up and that's what I'm most uh, excited about. Katie. Um, and uh, Tara, I'm going to go to you since we know that we can hear you now. And um, I mean, one of the things you work on is an innovation in this energy space. And, and can you tell me a little bit about, you know, just some of the changes you're seeing that's happening right now and, and what you're excited about moving forward? Yeah, I think uh, the ecosystem now is ready for uh, innovation in the area of the carbon dioxide capture, utilization, and storage. And uh, there are a lot of uh, work uh, on the area of the carbon dioxide capture and storage, but less work has done on the utilization part. And uh, what we do is to focus on the utilization part and, and uh, solve some challenges related to the cost because if we could use carbon dioxide as a feedstock, as a valuable uh, resource, then we can produce valuable products that generate actually revenue. And this helps a lot with the, with the whole process. Absolutely. Um, and then Barbara, I know that one of the things that Chevron Technology Ventures has been working on is, is the other side of that equation, uh, the carbon capture and storage mm -hmm. part. Um, and, and just for anybody um, listening that might, might not be familiar with that term, carbon capture, storage and utilization is, is often talked about as a solution to helping to reduce the emissions that are currently um, produced uh, by by fossil fuels. So um, Barbara, I'm gonna ask you, you, you don't have to talk about carbon capture and storage if you don't want to, but you yeah. certainly can. Uh, but I'm gonna ask you the same question. Um, what innovations are you seeing? What's exciting you right now? Uh, so I get excited about a lot of things, but let me, you know, first of all, big challenges and challenges that matter and lots of people coming together. So one thing that excites me is what you've heard from, uh, you know, I'll take Tara's started a new company and she's got investors and partners that are part of the establishment. So getting the incumbents and the new parties coming together and working. So that excites me. Um, Tara also talked about the fact that she took, you know, she's basically taking biology and chemistry and putting things together. So we're coming across disciplines. Um, so that's exciting. Um, you know, one of the things that um, we've got to work on, you know, with this dual challenge of being providing energy, but also working on the climate is this circular economy. We have to take care of um, the, the waste in our, in our world, whether it's solid, liquid, or gas, and finding innovation that can do that. Now, I'm excited about a lot of things and stuff, but I think that circular economy uh, which we talked about CO2, we've got projects going on here in Houston and, and really around the world around plastics waste. That's going to be really important. We have one planet, <laughs> we have, uh, you know, one set of resources, um, and there's a lot more life in them after they've been used one time. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited about a lot of it. And one of the things that will fuel it is um, the talent. So if you have people that are interested in innovation, um, you know, across a wide variety of, of um, uh, disciplines, focus on energy problems. They are problems that matter. Um, well, we just have a 
couple minutes left and uh, a question came in that I, I think is a great one. We've talked a lot about um, some of the exciting things happening, the innovation. But as I mentioned um, at the top, you know, we know that this that climate change um, is dire, that this this is an issue facing, um, you know, our generation and the the ones to come. Um, and so, you know, before I, I let you all go for the day, can we talk about um, the urgency behind this and you know, are, are we going to make it to, to 2050? And, and I hate to ask you, but just your, your best, you know, 30 second to a minute answer for, for a complicated question, but, but are we going to make it to 2050? And uh, Katie, let's, let's uh, go round Robin back to you. So I'm an eternal optimist, uh, but I also carried my then six-year-old daughter out of my home in chest high water. I'm worried. I'm nervous. But what I do know is that human ingenuity is in our DNA. It is human for us to progress. This is how we got to where we are, right? So I, I, I'm an optimist. I want to urge leaders that get together and companies that get together in academia, that get together in Glasgow to make significant commitments, and then let's go do it. We need to do it, right? We need to stop talking about it, and we need to make those uh, necessary investments and the necessary changes, but we also have to be realistic. Energy prices are through the roof, okay? Um, we're not going to create new things overnight. Uh, so this is going to be an expensive transition. We need to be uh, prepared for that, but I am an optimist because I know that people, um, it's it's wired in us to improve and to, to show progress, so. Yeah. Thanks, Katie. Uh, Tara, same, same question. Are we making it to 2050? Yeah, I, I'm very optimistic about it because I uh, feel that the tech, there are several aspects of technology that uh, are exist today, existing today, and we need to connect the dots together and have a bi, bi multidisciplinary approaches, and also using the the currently available assets and repurpose them. So, for instance, one of the areas that we are working is to um, use depleted uh, reservoirs and convert them to basically reactors and bioreactors to produce renewable energy, including hydrogen. Um, because in, in the reservoir, there are a huge amount of microbiome that they can do the job. Uh, and we have the knowledge and uh, technology to direct the, the microbes toward the desirable products, including mm -hmm. hydrogen. Great. Uh, all right, I'm, I'm getting the, the announcement one minute left. Barbara, are we making okay. it to 2050? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I agree with Katie, I, Tara, uh, I agree with you and, and the technology component. Here's the thing, um, we've got to act with urgency and it's gonna take a long time. So you gotta run fast and you gotta run long, but it's not just about making it, it's also about how we make it. And so this transition cannot you know, it, it, it cannot further create inequities. Um, it's gotta be just, uh, we, we, we can't solve that problem and create all the other problems. And, and that makes it harder and it makes um, just even more urgency about how we go about it. It has to be collaborative. Um, we have to quit thinking that it's we versus they, and we need to get around the table and work together on this because it's all of our collective futures that are impacted. Thank you. Katie Maynard, founder and CEO of Ally Energy, Barbara Berger, president of Chevron Technology Ventures, and Tara Karimi, co-founder and CTO at Samvita Factory. Thank you all so much for joining me. Thanks for being a part of this conversation. I'm Kyra Buckley with Houston Public Media, and I'm going to turn it back over now to the host. Thank you so much. Thank you. My name is Chris Olis, and I'm the executive director of the Special Initiative on Offshore Wind. We are a think tank that works on strategies to advance the responsible and sustainable development of offshore wind for the United States. I started this work 15 years ago when, after a trip to Europe, I looked around and saw the tremendous diversity of energy supply in their cities. And when I came back home to the United States, I didn't see that diverse energy supply mix. I didn't see solar panels on roofs. 
I didn't see wind turbines in the ocean or in backyards. And I was fascinated by that difference. And so starting with grad school, I pursued a degree in offshore wind planning and then ended up working in the industry directly after that. Right now, we have a grand total of seven offshore wind turbines spinning in U.S. waters. That compares to the over 5,000 turbines that spin around the world otherwise. Our nation has a target to get to 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by the year 2030, which would power about 8 million American homes with clean energy. We do have a long way to go, though, because those seven turbines produce 42 megawatts of offshore wind, and we ostensibly need to get to 30,000 megawatts of offshore wind by the date of 2030. Offshore wind will generate tens of thousands of jobs in the build-out of this target of getting to 30 gigawatts by 2030. The Biden administration projects that there will be about 80,000 jobs associated with that build-out. And those jobs really range from everything from the blue collar workers who are climbing and providing maintenance on the wind turbines to fishermen who are diversifying their vessels and servicing the wind farms to project managers and other workers who, you know, do the background and office work. So there really is a whole ecosystem of workers who are needed for these offshore wind farms. Really, the cities across the nation will benefit from this work. Some of the challenges to meet those targets include the development of our U.S. supply chain. Cities can play an integral role in the parts and the labor and the services that are required to build an offshore wind farm. In fact, we're already seeing here in the U.S. cities leading the way in Baltimore, Maryland, Sparrows Point, which is a retired Bethlehem steel power plant, is being retrofitted to build the steel towers that support the offshore wind turbines. In the port of Paulsboro on the Delaware River in New Jersey, a German manufacturer is relocating their steel fabrication facility so that they can also produce parts for offshore wind farms. The port of New Bedford in Massachusetts is developing an offshore wind cluster to supply parts needed to build offshore wind. So there's a lot of activity in U.S. states. When I think of what needs to be modernized in terms of the infrastructure for offshore wind, two main categories really come to mind. The first are our ports. Those ports for a long time have not been used and they've been abandoned. And so with offshore wind, there's an opportunity to repurpose those ports to build vessels and deploy offshore wind, whether that's for assembly or construction. The other thing that is important with respect to infrastructure is the modernization and the build out of our infrastructure electricity grid. That is critically important because coastal cities are, if you think about it, kind of at the end of the energy generation supply. The majority of our population in the United States lives on the coast in large cities. Those cities right now are powered by coal and nuclear power plants and as well as fossil fuel through natural gas. Traditionally, power plants are built inland. So if you think about the Atlantic coast of the United States, for example, Power plants are built in Pennsylvania or Western New Jersey, and then the power is transmitted across transmission lines. Finally, once it reaches the coast, those are essentially the little capillaries of transmission that make their way to the coast. But now we are proposing building energy in the ocean and flipping that model on its head. So while power has traditionally run from west to east, we are now proposing to run huge amounts of electricity from the ocean to land from east to west. And that's a fundamentally different way to treat the power grid. So there will be a lot of upgrades needed and really a, a completely different way to think about transmission. 
The first benchmark I would look for in the development and the acceleration of the offshore wind industry will be the development and construction of the first utility scale offshore wind farm. That project, the one that's first in queue, is called Vineyard Wind, and it is scheduled to be built off of the coast of Massachusetts in the next few years. That is an 800 megawatt project that will connect directly into Massachusetts and provide great jobs, clean energy, and excellent coastal benefits to those coastal cities. So for me and the industry, we are looking to that Vineyard Wind project to bring benefits and really the signal to the industry that we are ready to turn to utility scale development of these projects. The current public attitude towards offshore wind overall is very positive. Polling continues to show that offshore wind is a desired source of energy supply, especially in the renewable energy space for our cities. However, there are some who are the vocal minority who do protest the development of offshore wind. I think of it in three different categories. One are the coastal community members who prefer to not see offshore wind turbines on the horizon. And in those communities, um, you know, we can see that the turbines are very far offshore, usually 15 to 20 or more miles from shore. So the turbines themselves are quite small on the horizon. However, to some coastal landowners, they find that disturbing and offensive and do protest the turbines. The second category of stakeholders who are objecting to offshore wind are the commercial and recreational fishing community who feel that their traditional fishing opportunities will be disrupted by the turbines that are in the ocean. And the third community that does object to offshore wind are some of the environmental groups who are concerned that marine wildlife could be impacted by offshore wind. For example, the North Atlantic right whale that is a critically endangered species migrates up and down the Atlantic coast of the United States where the real majority of offshore wind is being proposed right now. The North Atlantic right whale migration could be disrupted either by the construction techniques that are used to build offshore wind or by the operations of those wind farms. However, when we dig a little deeper when speaking with the NGO community, they know and they recognize and share that climate change really is the biggest threat to any species that's living in the ocean. And so if we are not proactive and in fact aggressive in getting offshore wind built, then we know that the biggest impacts will come from the impacts of climate change. Well, there's a lot there and a lot to think about. And we're going to carry on with this conversation, thinking about actually something that Chris just said, completely different ways to think about electricity transmission and what that will take to transform things. I'd like to welcome Ralph Izzo. He's chairman, president, CEO of PSEG. It's a publicly traded diversified energy company that's based in New Jersey. He began as a research scientist, has been kind of working his whole life in the energy sector. So he knows it well, I like this. If you go to his LinkedIn page, you'll see a quote that I think should power our conversation. His vision for what he describes as, quoting here, a future in which people use less energy and that energy is cleaner and delivered more reliably than ever before. Um, Ralph Izzo, welcome to you. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Frank. Thanks for having me here today. I'm delighted to have you here. So um, I'll get to what Chris said in a minute, but you know, thinking about all that we've heard here, there's a ton of talk these days, right? And a, potentially a ton of money around infrastructure. Um, and a lot of it to pr promote sustainability and resilience in our cities, roads, bridges, tunnels, pipelines, and yes, the um, electrical grid. How should cities, in your view, prioritize? That's a tough question, right, Frank, because it's so case specific. Uh, you know, I would think if I were to just generalize, which is going to have its limitations, the first thing I would make sure was that my potable water system was clean and, and accessible, right? Because that, that's obviously of, of tantamount importance. But then I would say that whatever else is in need of greatest repair, 
and it will vary from city to city. I would do it with climate change in mind. Mm -hmm. Do with the notion of I want to avoid uh, carbon emissions in the future. So that implies for my transportation system, electrifying mass transit, electrifying buses, electrifying vehicles. But I'd also sadly have to do it with the recognition that some of the effects of climate change are here. So that whatever I do needs to be much more resilient to extreme weather conditions than it had been in the past. So, so it's really more just sort of viewing through the lens of climate change, whatever, whatever particular infrastructure challenge I have needs to recognize the reality of what is here and what could be here if we don't act uh, prophylactically. Hey, hey Ralph, the, the, the first question I probably should have asked you is, is that log cabin you're standing in a real log cabin or is that a virtual background? Because that looks no, pretty it's, inviting. It's, it's real. It's, it's, okay. No, 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 no. Let me come back to that. So maybe that supports your, the, the quote that you had earlier. And I would like you to explain that perhaps. This idea of a future in which people use less energy, which is cleaner and delivered more reliably than ever before. I mean, you're a business that traffics in energy. You transmit energy. You sell energy. Do you really want people to use less of it? Are you encouraged? We really do. So yep, yep. How does that fit a business plan? Well, so, so through the leadership of Governor Phil Murphy and his Board of Public Utilities, we've redesigned regulation in New Jersey so that we are really an infrastructure company. And if we invest in infrastructure that is helpful to the customer, we're compensated. So believe it or not, our shareholders are indifferent as to whether or not we put money into an LED light bulb or we put money into a transformer. It's, it's treated the exact same way. And one of the things I like to do when I'm in person with people is I give them a little quiz and I ask folks, uh, how many of you woke up this morning and said, I can't wait to use a kilowatt hour? <laughs> no one has ever raised their hand. So if we could provide the same comfort in the heat of summer and the dark of night and the cold of winter, but have people use less energy in, in obtaining that comfort, then everybody wins. The customer has a lower bill. The environment is better off, and our shareholders are indifferent. We heard Chris Olath a few moments ago talking about wind generation, if it's done 30 by 30, as discussed, power being generated out in the, in the ocean, out in the, in the water, and being transmitted east to west. She said, we're going to need a completely different way to think about transmission. Right. You agree with that? Do we have to completely remake the way we send electricity back and forth and across the country? Yes, I think she's substantially correct, right? So, so again, if I start with the premise that the cleanest kilowatt hour is the one that you don't use, and oh, by the way, that's also the cheapest way to eliminate carbon emissions. You can actually save money and reduce carbon. The next thing that you need to do, as you correctly pointed out earlier, Frank, is make sure that we... Uh, are investing in clean energy supplies. Now, the beauty of renewables is that they're clean. The challenge of renewables is that oftentimes the most resource rich regions of the nation don't correspond to where the population centers are. So you have to transmit that power over long distances. And typically speaking, the transmission system wasn't designed to transmit power over long distances. It's AC circuits versus DC circuits. It's uh, it's, a, it's bottleneck facilities that, that result when you try to move things uh, over multiple jurisdictions as opposed to in proximity to load. So we will have to change and make adjustments in our, in our high voltage transmission system. So, so help people understand that. And let's think about somebody in Providence, Rhode Island or Norfolk, Virginia or Chicago, Illinois or Des Moines or Denver or Sacramento. What are these cities going to have to do and invest in to make this future that you're talking about happen? How sweeping and expensive is that going to be? So it will, it will vary by those cities. And I would say that first thing that they should do, <laughs> I'm gonna sound like a broken record, is ask themselves whether or not they're using the most efficient devices in their home. Have they programmed their thermostats? Have they switched their light bulbs? Are they using highly rated air conditioning refrigeration systems? After that, then the question will become, <clears throat> what is the most, viable resource for our region. Should we keep alive our existing nuclear plants? Because they've largely been paid for, they're carbon free. Are we more in a solar rich region or in a wind rich region? If neither of those, which is in closest proximity to us and what transmission investments do we need to make? All of this could be solved, Frank, quite candidly, if we had a price on carbon. 
then everyone would be able to see, okay, I now know what it's going to cost me to emit carbon, and I know what the boogeyman is then that I need to do better than to avoid that carbon emission. And maybe it's a wind farm, maybe it's a solar farm, maybe it's an electric vehicle, maybe it's changing an agricultural practice. But if you have an economy-wide price on carbon, you can have much more uh, efficient decisions being made about what choices to make. Ralph, if I look out my window now, which I'm doing, I see my neighbor next door, and his roof is covered with solar panels. Right. He recently bought an EV, and his EV right. is plugged in, and it's charging right. from solar panels. Right. He sells excess electricity back to his utility. If this, across the street, I see another one. If this were to catch on everywhere, here and elsewhere, what does that mean for the grid? And how do you have to adapt? Because I don't think people realize this, but this is just not, if you will, a flip of the switch. No, it is not. And, and, and despite the fact that I'm delighted that your neighbor is helping to save the planet, I would much rather see those solar panels in a centralized location so that other people can enjoy it as well and not be distributed house by house. Uh, because it's much more expensive house by house than it is if it's grid connected. The issue, the primary issue that you're hinting at, Frank, is going to be the sun is shining now, it's not shining tonight. And the sun is shining less today than it will in August. And the amount of electricity your neighbor will need in April versus August are vastly different. So the dispatchability, as we refer to it, the, the need for storage is going to become a major challenge. So our grid will need to be much smarter and more flexible. It will need to be able to source and deliver power with much greater flexibility than it's designed to do today because the grid was originally centrally planned. We knew where the big power plants were going to be. We knew where people lived and we can design the wires to connect the dots. Uh, if, if the supply options now are sprinkled all over the place and they're not always available to do what either the local user wants or a distant user wants, our grid is gonna to have to be the one that uh, adjusts on a, on a regular basis. My neighbor is going to be very upset when I tell him he's not saving the planet as efficiently as he could. He's but really not. I'm sorry. I promise you he's not he's taking not. those panels down. Um, <laughs> as we think about rebuilding cities, which is the theme of this conversation here today, uh, and thinking about your sector and this part of infrastructure, can you point to a city, a municipality that's ahead of the curve, that's getting this right, that's anticipating who are they, where are they, and what are they doing exactly? Well, so, they, so I'm most familiar with New Jersey, and there are things going on, for example, in the city of Hoboken, where there's a lot of planning of the possibility of microgrids and electrifying transportation and uh, uh, electric vehicle charging stations. So those are, I think, the types of things that uh, I, if I were a city planner and a city manager, I would start thinking about today. You know, candidly, when I think of cities, I think oftentimes of vertical residence buildings. It's really hard to do rooftop solar and supply the energy needs of all the people living underneath that rooftop. So that's not a really a good approach. I would think more in terms of, am I, am I making myself a much more efficient transportation hub? And am I making my grid more resilient to the inevitable storms come of, of the future? And what about the, 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 the power of the marketplace in our cities and urban places? where you've got major customers, whether they're big box stores or others, and they're demanding from their utility renewable energy because they're passing on the, the, the pressure for sustainability from their customers in the marketplace. Is that yeah. a factor too? Yeah, there's no doubt that there is. And, I, and I, I really am fond of and congratulate some of the large brand building that goes on. But one of my concerns with that, Frank, is we would, we would be less than honest if, if, if we allowed a business to say, uh, <clears throat> I am completely powering my business by renewable energy, because that would lead people to believe that everybody can do that. And, and the grid cannot do, the laws of physics won't allow that to happen today. Uh, so, so even though I, I think we have to really congratulate and support folks who are advocates and, and, and eager to promote renewable energy, we, we have to remember some of the issues and challenges that happen when you go from the sort of paltry amount that we have today to the more deeper penetration of tomorrow. From our audience, there, there seems to be someone who knows you or knows of you, Ralph, and points out that, and actually credits you with being a bit ahead of the curve in the utility yeah. sector with respect to climate change, and points out you have a five-point strategy. Uh, what is your five-point strategy? Ah, yes. Yeah. So, so 
Uh, number one is this economy-wide price on carbon, because we think that will lead to the most intelligent decisions made by the market, the market consisting of consumers, investors, and, uh, and policy uh, uh, makers. Then we believe what that will point out is that the smartest thing you could do is energy efficiency, get people to use less. The second thing we need to do is make sure that we don't go backwards. And by that, I mean, we need to preserve the existing nuclear fleet, which provides 50% of the carbon-free energy of the nation today. Uh, then we need to expand the supply stack with, re with renewable energy, solar and wind, onshore and offshore, and hopefully in the future, advanced nuclear and carbon capture and storage for what I think is an important fuel, natural gas. And then the last thing is we need to electrify the economy, starting with transportation, which is the uh, number one source of carbon emissions in the nation today. So economy-wide price on carbon, preserve the nuclear fleet, expand renewables, make sure we're as energy efficient as possible and have an economy, electrify the entire economy beginning with transportation. Let, let me ask you a question here that will kind of reveal that I've been around for a while longer than I might care to admit. And it relates to, to cost and price when you talk about carbon pricing or anything else. I remember, and I'm here in Washington and I've covered this stuff as a journalist for a very long time. I was in covering the president, President Ronald Reagan, when for a brief shining moment, he proposed a 25 cent a gallon gasoline tax phased in over five years. You would have thought that he was raiding everybody's wallet or the administration was proposing and it didn't go anywhere. I remember when, you know, Al Gore tried the, the, the BTU tax in the Clinton administration that didn't go anywhere. Talking about pricing carbon, talking about these other things, how, how do you convince people that Maybe this shouldn't be looked at as a cost, but as an investment. Oh, it's, 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 I think it's very easy to be honest with you, Frank. They're paying for it now. So in New Jersey and in many locations, probably your neighbor, that rooftop solar system is costing the equivalent of three to $400 per ton of carbon eliminated. The energy efficiency programs that I've referred to can save customers $100 for every ton of carbon they eliminate. Why would, why would we have public policies that on the one hand cost $300 per ton and others that save $100 per ton? Isn't it pretty obvious which is the smarter thing to do? And the answer is, it's not obvious that it costs $300 per ton because the investment tax credit and the solar renewable energy credits, the subsidies that are delivered don't give a clear signal to the market as to what it's costing the taxpayer and the consumer. If you had that visible price, then people would make the right decision. Uh, so, so that visible price, that price on carbon, uh, I would just simply say, believe the National Academy of Sciences, put it at $50 a ton. Do you think there's any reasonable chance to see a carbon tax happen anytime soon? Well, I think that there's a chance. I don't think it's a reasonable chance, to be <laughs> sadly honest. Yeah, and <laughs> absent that, can we do what we need to do to move aggressively against climate change? I, I, I am pleased that at least there's been a recognition of the severity of climate change and you're seeing extensions of investment and production tax credits. You're hearing the creation of new production tax credits to save the existing nuclear fleet. There's been some talk of a clean electricity performance program. I believe that's probably not likely to happen in the near term, but at least there is a healthy amount of dialogue taking place on this essential issue. What role does nuclear power play in our future and what are the implications there for infrastructure? Yeah, well, as, as I may have mentioned a moment ago, so right now about 20% of our electricity is supplied by nuclear power, but that represents over 50% of the carbon-free electricity. In New Jersey, the numbers are even higher, right? So it's 40% of our supply, but 90% of our carbon-free supply. There, are, there is research going on right now on more advanced cycles that can be what's called passively safe. That won't need to have the number of engineering systems to make sure that there's, that there's no risk of an issue uh, should, should the primary systems fail. And, and, I, and, and there's research going on to make those plants smaller and therefore uh, more affordable, smaller chunks. And I am hopeful that uh, over the period of uh, next uh, 10 plus years or so, that we could see those advanced technologies play an important role. Because again, despite the fact that I am a huge fan of renewable energy, we have not solved the storage issue, which is a, which is a big challenge when it comes to meeting the reliability of the grid. But a, a robust future for nuclear power? Uh, I, I think it, it can have a robust future. At this point in time, the nation's clearly pointing its, uh, itself more towards renewables coupled with storage. But, but
but it has put some modest investment into new. So, so let me ask you this. A big part, uh, as we know, of climate change is hotter temperatures. Phoenix, Arizona had over 145 days last year, over 100 degrees. The heat dome comes over the Pacific Northwest and it's absolutely brutal and people are racing to put in air conditioners. California, with its additional heat, has power surges and they have potential you know, occasional rolling brownouts. How do you see the supply and demand equation here, Ralph, as we're going forward in an, what appears to be an ever warmer climate? Yeah, so there's no question that you have these cyclical issues that, that arise and that they're going to be even more challenged the more we rely on Mother Nature, as you can see right now in the United Kingdom and parts of the EU, we have these anomalous wind conditions that have resulted in some real serious supply constraints from the offshore wind farms and therefore tremendous demand for natural gas and coal, which is driving price spikes there. That's why I keep emphasizing energy efficiency and demand response, the ability to put more uh, surplus capacity, if you will, in the system by being able to control the demand side of the equation. Uh, but the, the issues and challenges that you point to, Frank, in terms of hotter temperatures driving greater demand, uh, you, not only is that the problem, but, but more severe weather events, right. they're putting physical constraints on the system as, as equipment breaks uh, will also um, make it uh, challenging in the future and therefore drive the need for excess capacity. Okay, let me ask you my last question then about the future. Okay. Fast forward 10 or 20 years, and it is amazing how quickly that kind of time actually passes, right? right. And if you think about Washington, D.C., where I am, or Nashville, or San Antonio, or Denver, or Los Angeles, or Huntsville, Let's just imagine for a minute, there really have been epic changes. Uh, there's been a lot of money spent investment in infrastructure. Okay, you look around, what do you see? What do those cities look like now, 20 years from now, if they've done it right? I, I see a completely electrified transportation system. I see an uh, underground electric system that is resilient to extreme weather. I see carbon-free sources of energy of all manner, including carbon capture and storage for natural gas driven systems, rooftop solar, grid connected solar, rooftop wind. Uh, I, I, if you let me go to 10 years, I see packaged nuclear plants. Uh, and, and I see an infrastructure that recognizes the severity of the weather that we've already baked into the system, whether it's bridge fortification or, or water pipe uh, uh, fortification from from uh, stormwater intrusions or things of that nature. But basically I see that the two major differences will be a decarbonized electricity supply system and a highly electrified transportation system. And do you think that's where we're going inevitably or do we really, really have to work hard and twist arms to get to that place? I think sadly we still have to work hard and twist arms to get there despite the mounting, mounting evidence. Uh, I, I regret that I have to point out that the only thing the science has gotten wrong in its predictions about climate change is the fact that it's happening faster than was ever predicted before. Yeah, yeah. The direction has never been mistaken. And maybe human nature too. <laughs> but we can, we can work at it. And I'll just pass on one other comment from the audience to you. Hope we hear more from Mr. Izzo in the national news. So somebody likes what you're saying and I would endorse that. I think we could- Thanks for, thanks for letting me spend time we, with you. We need, we need your vision and we need, we need you know, these things to happen. So thank you so much for your time and good luck. And, Love that cabin, so I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Take care. Take good care. Well, we'll close out our climate uh, conversation today with a couple of reflections um, and some thoughts from um, Benji Backer. He's a young and very impressive conservative trying to rally um, his party faithful and support his generation around climate policy. It's been a great pleasure to be with you today and be part of this conversation. Stay with us at 1.30 Eastern. My colleague Alicia Menendez is up with in the next chapter of this conversation, immigration. I'm Frank Sesno. As I say, it's been a great pleasure. Take a listen now to Benji Backer. Yeah, I'm a conservative climate activist who believes that the conservative movement needs to have a much larger role in how we tackle climate change. I'm 23 and over half my life I've spent as a conservative activist.
So conservatives backing away from this conversation for the past decade or two, when they used to lead it, has been really harmful. Over half the country deserves a voice on climate change. It cannot just be a one-sided issue. And that's what I set out to do, was to change that. The conservative agenda to climate change really revolves around what we can do here in the United States to reduce our impact in terms of carbon emissions and pollution. So what we believe is that innovation and technology and capitalism can play a very large role in how we reduce emissions. And then the second part of how we bring conservatives into this is really through this thing called natural climate solutions, which is basically what it sounds like, using nature to fight climate change. We believe that the more trees we plant, the more wetlands we restore, the more sustainable agriculture practices that we deploy, the better. And that also helps uh, bring in the communities that conservatives often represent, which is those rural communities. So we pair this innovation and technological approach with this natural kind of returning to conservation roots. And we think that those two things can help bring us to at least the next decade of climate action. The role for government is absolutely there and it's absolutely crucial. But I think where this conversation has gone wrong is looking at the federal government as the end all be all rather than just one part of the puzzle. We can have solutions at all levels, the federal government, the state government, the city government, the local governments, as well as in the private sector. I really like the work that is being done in Miami, Florida, where there is a Republican mayor, uh, Francis Suarez, who has his own sustainability and climate plan and is deploying it every single day. He's building out EV infrastructure. There's an immense growth in solar and wind in the city. And they're also adapting to the, to the massive impacts that climate change is already having in Miami. And he's also working with the, with the corporate community, bringing in a lot of the companies that are helping solve this problem into Miami and having them be headquartered there so that they can use the talent of Southeast Florida. And in fact, he is seen as a global leader uh, as a mayor on climate action. And I've toured around the country to meet with these different leaders in different uh, small towns and big cities, is that everyone wants a stake at the table. And a small town in Wisconsin where I grew up has a very different way of looking at climate change than Miami, Florida. And it should, because a city in Wisconsin has a different economy, it has a different culture, it has different energy sources. And we can bring those communities in by talking about solutions that really resonate with them. And those solutions are not going to resonate with somebody in Miami, Florida. Uh, in Georgetown, Texas, uh, they have a very conservative mayor who also is very pro-climate action. In Oklahoma City, uh, David Holt is doing the exact same thing. But one of the big problems in those cities is that mayors uh, who are conservative oftentimes don't realize that they can engage in a way that is authentic to their conservative beliefs. And what I would tell those conservative mayors is, you can. You can engage with climate change in a way that resonates with your city. And even if it's a fossil fuel dependent city, you can make this approach an all the above energy approach where you're using technology on every single uh, energy source to reduce emissions. You can find carbon capture technologies or lower flare emitting technologies for fossil fuels and deploy clean energy at the same time. We need that sort of leadership and we need Texas and Oklahoma cities uh, and cities in other states like that to take a step forward. If we don't, our, our, our globe is going to perish, but also those cities are going to lose a seat at the table. And that's the importance of including Texas, Oklahoma, and these fossil fuel dependent areas into the conversation. And more importantly, is why it's vital for those mayors to lead in a way that is authentic to their city. The conservative movement is absolutely hurt when conservatives don't engage on climate change because they're losing an entire generation of voters and they're losing an entire opportunity for policies that fall within conservative values. People in my age group don't really wanna vote for conservative leaders because they perceive them as climate deniers. And nationally, the conversation is so anti-conservative in terms of policy that now we're getting closer and closer to policies that conservatives are going to hate. I'm a believer in incrementalism and taking steps that are bigger than the last. We've been waiting for two decades for climate leadership and my generation is sick of waiting. First and foremost, what we want to see is this issue to be a bigger priority. It should not be in the top 20. It should not be in the top 10. We want it to be in the top five. We want this to be a top five issue for conservatives when they're running for office. And we want conservatives to put forward real solutions, not just talking points. We want solutions. And if that doesn't happen and the prioritization doesn't happen, then young conservative climate activists will leave the conservative movement.